I think in terms of markets, I think everybody is concerned about basically two to three things. The first thing that they're concerned is where the hell the bottom is in terms of the stock market. I think we are very close to a bottom. I think right now, if we're already, if not already at the bottom. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Real Vision, for this uh, great opportunity for me to interview my mentor, my macro dad. That's what I'm going to call him. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Chen Zhao. Oh, Chen Zhao. Chen, hey. it's great to, uh, great to meet you. Uh, I mean, great to meet you. Great to see you on, uh, on interview. Great to do this with you. Um, we're, we're nominally going to talk about China. That's sure. what we've been asked by Real Vision to do. But um, I want to uh, introduce the audience a little bit more uh, and, and get a little bit more out of you than just China. Uh, you're obviously the founder uh, of, uh, of Alpine Macro, which is a sell-side independent research firm based in Montreal, uh, longtime BCA research chief strategist. Uh, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit of your personal story. You know, like, how did you become a macro maven? You know, why are we talking to you about China? Okay, that's a good question. That's a good starting point. Uh, by the way, yeah, you know, it's too, too kind of too kind of you, uh, Marco, to call me uh, your mentor. I'm, uh, I'm I'm not sure I'm really mentoring anything, but hey, you are a geopolitical genius of of, of these days. So, but anyway. Uh, let's stop uh, petting our own shoulders. Let me give you my two cents of my story. As you know, I joined BCA in, uh, in 1992. Uh, basically, I've done three things with the, with, the, with the company. I created BCA's China research back in 1993. At the time, there was basically no China, re no independent China research available at the time. And then I uh, created BCA's um, emerging market strategy back in 98. Actually, I wrote both publications all the way till uh, 2005. Uh, and in 2005, I took over uh, BCA's global investment strategy. I was their chief global strategist. Um, and I, I ran that pub publication from 2005 to 2015, so about 10 years. And then 2015, I decided a time to uh, to change. Yeah, so that's when I joined a global bond fund called Brian D1 Global. I was their co-head of research for about two years. And then I decided that's not something I really want because it's a bond fund, it's kind of boring. Every, every day you just talk about bonds. And, and on top of that, you really don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to, to understand the world. And then I decided, what the hell, we just, I just go ahead and do what I really enjoy to do. So I basically teamed up with Tony Back, who is uh, ex owner of BCA. Um, I was uh, I was a partner, and he was ex owner, and then we together we basically funded Alpine Macro in October seventeen. So, uh, but anyway, after 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 about a, what, four three four years, and now we have about a 40 staff. Uh, we have, uh, you know, all the major uh, veteran uh, BCA strategists. Uh, they were pretty much uh, with us right now, uh, including David Abramson, 27 years with BCA, including uh, Harvinder Kalarai, you know, BCA's chief currency strategist. Uh, Yang Wang, BCA's China, chief China strategist for about 17 years. Caroline Miller um, and Mark McLaughlin, about 30 some years of BCA. But anyway, uh, that's the brief story. A bunch of guys, we just want to uh, try to figure out the markets. That's why we we're creating this firm, we're having some fun. Well, let, let me let me take you even further back. I mean, yeah. tell us how did you? I mean, you're you're obviously from China. Real yeah. Vision wants to talk about China. Yeah. Um, how how did you get to? Canada and how did how did that happen? Oh, I was uh, you know actually I was pretty active in 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 Chinese uh, economic reform uh, uh, at the sort of in the nineteen eighties. I was I wrote a lot of articles, wrote of pieces at the time. Uh, was considered as a bit of a radical side in in terms of um, proposing some of the reform stuff. 
And then, um, you know, at the time, there's some of those stuff actually was, was quite uh, interesting and hard uh, in China. And then, actually, I was sent to uh, United States to do to do some research work at university, the University of Illinois for about a few years. That was 1998. And 99, you know, the Tiananmen Square happened. And lots of my pieces were openly questioned and criticized at the time. So I figured that it's not a good time for me to return to China. That's why I went on to do my PhD program uh, in the US and then, then moved to Canada. So that's that's sort of how I settled here in, in North America. And then Tony Beck, who is the ex-owner of BCA, actually got in touch with me. At the time, BCA was very hot on China. They want to cover China in, in the early 90s because Tony basically f figured that the Chinese story will become pretty big, so they, they need to have some coverage. That's when I, had, I got into touch with, with Tony, and then uh, he hired me. Uh, that's what I told you that by 93, I created the China analyst at the time it was BCA's, uh, independent China research. So that's the story as how I joined BCA. So, you know, um, I always think that my background, yeah. uh, I grew up in a communist country. I went through hyperinflation, civil war has shaped me. And how do you think that growing up in China? at the time a communist country, but reforming obviously in the yeah. late 80s, as you're saying, you were active in the 80s yeah. in terms of all these things. It's an emerging market. You saw you saw China kind of add that Delta inflection. How does that shape your worldview? How does that I make think, you a better you know, strategy? Uh, yeah, not only me, Marcos, but lots of the Chinese uh, strategists, you know, the strategists by the Chinese origin, you know, either they born in China or came out of China, they traditionally, most of them actually have a sort of bullish bias because, you know, well, I, <laughs> you know, right. I said, you know, I, I, uh, I was at a university, uh, in the late seventies and then, uh, eight, late seventies and throughout the nineties and eighties and nineties, that was a period that there were lots of positive changes. So of course it's sometimes a painful, but Hey, you were dealing with the economy, you know, you, you you take very rapid growth as a given. You sort of a, got an idea that the natural state of any economy should be uh, positive growth all the time. Because that's why uh, I have I have had a sort of positive bias uh, throughout. You know, that's a, if you're talking about impact, that's the impact. I mean, not only me, and then if you talk to lots of lots of uh, strategies that come from China, they all have this bullish bias. They will always think that, you know, positive growth is a natural state of the economy, which actually might be true for lots of economy, but which actually is not true for others. That's later on, we realize that, right? So that's, that's, that's the thing. That's interesting. You know, you just made me think I'm often very blase yeah. about things going on around the world. Like, ah, it's okay. You know, it'll, it'll play itself out. And it's because, you know, <laughs> when I was a kid, I grew up in yeah. a place that basically collapsed. And it's like, yeah, you know, are you being chased on the way to school by, by dogs? No, then you're good. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, let me ask you, I want to, yeah. uh, so again, we have to get to China. That's, yeah. that's what we have to talk about. Yeah. But before then, before yeah. then, you're not a China strategist, just to be clear. You're Chinese. Yeah. yeah. But you're I'm not a China strategist. strategist. Yeah. You yeah. are a global macro strategist. And I would say, yeah. if not the best one of the best in the world. That's just my view. But like, I want to, before we get to China, I want to get your big picture. You know, like, what is your view right now? What do you think is happening in the markets? What are three things we all have to kind of really think about? And what do you expect to happen over the next six months? So uh, that's a good, that's a very good uh, starting point. I think in terms of markets, I think everybody is concerned about basically two to three things. The first thing that they're concerned is where the hell the bottom is in terms of the stock market. I think we are very close to a bottom. I think right now, if we're already, if not already at the bottom, the reason for that is um, we've made a substantial uh, reduction in terms of multiples, in terms of equity PEs. Uh, you have to basically make a judgment call. The judgment call has to be whether we're making a structural transition 
from low inflation time to high inflation environment. If we're moving, if we are indeed making a secular transformation from low inflation regime to a high inflation environment, then I guarantee you that the market is not going to bottom at any time soon. But you know, I I am a deflationist. I don't believe that we're making that transition because um, I don't think the fundamental forces that actually uh, that will sustain low inflation environment is remain very much in place. It's, it's still existing as they are now changed from the uh, from the world economy uh, that was uh, pretty much um, that was pretty much. Uh, define the world economy, an oversaving problem, the uh, uh, demographic problem in most of the developed countries. I don't think that thing has changed at all since the uh, pandemic. Um, so if, if I take that view, um, and I think that it will be a proof, that will prove to be a right view, then uh, the, equity, the equity market has made a substantial downward adjustment that has already discounted let's say 10, 15% of profit decline. Because if you don't have a sustained uh, rise in inflation, then you don't need to make compensation for a sustained multiple compression. So in other words, I'm, I'm looking for Fed to make a dovish pivot, probably early part of next year. I'm looking for inflation that's gonna be substantially lower six months out than today. And that's the base, that's the basics uh, why you want to be taking a positive view. And right just, just to yeah. tell all the viewers, because literally yeah. five minutes ago, you said you had yeah. a bullish bias. Yeah. I do want to say you yeah. and the team at Alpine Macro, you guys were bearish and you were early on the recession call. Yeah. Inconsistent. So, yeah. so let me just, uh, so, so first of all, for all the viewers who are saying like, well, he's just bullish again, you know, why should I believe him that it's bottom? Chen has been bearish, uh, I would say, for like maybe eight months or so. Thanks. Well, actually, we, publi we published our annual outlook December 10th. Okay, so that was the first time we laid out the bearish case. You got to be careful because the uh, the Fed is going to. That's eight uh, months. Yeah. So yeah, you you've been bearish for eight months. And let me ask you something now. Yeah. Now you 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 made the recession call. Um, can you just for the sake yeah. of like. Are we in a recession? Is it over? Is it a technical shallow right. recession? How do how do yeah. we square your view that the equity I mean, market? Yeah, is that's that's good. Great starting point, uh, Marco. The uh, lots of people are saying we're probably already in a recession because first qu first quarter GDP was negative. If you look at the uh, GDP now cast, yeah, most likely like end up with another another negative uh, number. So by definition, two. Uh, consecutive quarter of negative growth, you you already in recession. I, I don't believe that is that argument. I think that's a technical. When I'm talking about recession, we usually mean when people talk about recession, we usually refer to a broad based decline in economic activity, which means you have to have a rising unemployment rate, you have to have falling wage growth, you have to have a contracting consumption, which is about seventy three percent of the U.S. economy. Without which, without all of that, you cannot care, you cannot really call something uh, like a two quarter of negative growth as recession. But I think that's first thing you got to keep in mind. The second thing is, are we going into recession? I think we're probably most likely we will. Uh, the reason for that is um, if you look at the curve, the yield curve. I know everybody understands that the yield curve is inverted, but hey, I'm just looking at the real household income in the United States. The real household income today is growing at a minus 12%. It is not slowing, it's collapsed. Uh, not only because of the, the physical, uh, uh, it's not because of the uh, the the checks, the, uh, um, what do you call it, the, the COVID stimulus. checks. Yeah. Stimulus basically being withdrawn. Um, but also if you look at the physical impulse in the United States, we're talking about a minus three, a minus four to minus 7% of GDP. So the physical policy is also tightening quite dramatically too. And on, not, on top of that, you have inflation that is actually eating your, your spending power. So be careful here. When we talk about recession, we talk about the real GDP, real output. Right now, the real consumption is still growing at about 4% annualized rate because of the fact that people are saving less. They're trying to use the saving to support uh, 
the consumption. Hey, we all we all learn our economics. Your consumption is going to be dictated by your income over a period of time, for sure. That's a, that's a given correlation. That's why I think it, it, by observing where the real income is, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have a period of pretty uh, pretty weak consumer spending. I don't know when, to be honest. I don't want I want to don't want to pretend that I know. I think sometimes next year. That's why I think we, we will go into a recession. But I don't think it's a a financial crisis driven recession. It's pro probably more, more of a run of the mill recession because the rates are rising too. The rate the rates have been lifted too high. The income growth is not going to be there, and people tend to save a little more and spend a little less, and then you're going to have a contraction in economic activity. Just to be clear, though, the uh, stock yeah. market has bottomed, and you do not expect another bear market because of the recession. The I, stock I, market, I don't think so. Yeah, it's already no, discounted. Think, yeah, yeah if you think about it, uh, yeah, if you market, if you think about the uh, '70s bear markets, '70s stock market. If you look at total drawdown in stock prices, it's always way bigger than the total drawdown in earnings, in EPS. The reason for that is you basically have to make two compensations. The first compensation is they have to compensate the rising, sustainably rising interest rates. That multiple has to come down in addition to the compensation for, for lower uh, profit growth or profit contraction. So basically you have to have lower multiples to reflect both higher interest rates and profit contraction during a recession. That is a 70s story. If you look at the recent decades, especially after the 2000 birth of the tech bubble, the size of bear market in stock prices is always equal to the size of earnings. Earnings contraction. That was you saying. The market is very smart in figuring out one thing, which is you do not need very high interest rates uh, to deal with all this uh, inflation problem. That's why the rates are always staying down. So the market understands that. That's why the bear market is always trying to, the, the investor on, on average, basically collectively trying to figure out where the hell the, the earnings contraction will be. And then stock prices usually reflect that only. So I'm saying that's very important here. Uh, your inflation call. If you're an inflationist, you think that inflation is going to accelerate continuously, then I'll be deadly wrong. I'll be to totally toast. That basically saying you're going to make 1970s type of adjustment, which means that your multiples have to, to be lower structurally. And on top of that, you have to also add whatever profit contraction that you, you may have. But if you don't believe that we're moving into a sustainably higher inflation regime, then I would say the multiple reduction has, has now fully discounted whatever the earning contraction we may have during a recession. So I don't know, that it, it, is that a logical, uh, clear? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it is. It is. Yeah. I think the one, the one challenge might yeah. be that, you know, we don't have to be in the 1970s. Right. But we could be in a different regime. Like, why right. can't we have inflation between 2 and 4%? Yeah. I think that's uh, lots of people take that view. I, my, f my fear, my concern is that we might go into a period where inflation is going to be substantially lower than a lot of people uh, anticipate. You could ha even have a whiff of deflation. There are a couple of things here. Number one, if you look at the well, now we bring in China, and then we can talk about uh, a little bit more about China. But China here is only one side of the equation here. If you think about Chinese economic recovery, it's all production recovery. There's no consumption recovery. And the production recovery is all uh, built on, leverage on the U.S. spending boom that we've had. So if the U.S. Got, the economy got into recession, my concern is that the Chinese uh, manufacturing is going to liquidate. And that's going to drive down tradable goods prices. That's one source of deflation. Another source of deflation is if you look at the U.S. dollar now, the dollar is very strong and all the retailers and, and wholesalers in the United States, they're all overstocking. You, you can see the real yep. inventory basically shot up it's about 10 percent, okay? Yep. So if you want to, you know, if you as an economy get into a recession, you want demand start to weaken. You don't have to weaken a lot, it just weakens somewhat. I, my concern is you might have a liquidation cycle 
that is gonna that is gonna really drive down price prices. That's the second thing. The final thing here is if you, I, yeah, I'm just gonna kick back to New York, man. Oh man, the price level is high. I mean, you go to restaurants, and this is crazy. You know, we're probably talking about 50, 60 percent price increases. The level of prices are already very high, and inflation is a profoundly a rate of change concept, it's a speed concept. So if the prices keep going up, we're all toast. But I don't believe that is going to be the case. So if the price level stayed still in a year time, a couple of quarters, then your inflation rate is going to crash towards zero. So if you take all this into consideration, I think, you know, if I want to make a bet, my bet is that inflation probably going to be a whole lot lower than most people anticipate. By the way, five, five forward inflation break even yeah. uh, rate. Great point. Yeah. It's just plummeting. I, I, I keep looking at that. No, I, I yeah. hear you. I yeah, hear you. I That's it. I, I think, you know, like uh, one of our, our great friends and my yeah. other mentor, Francis yeah. Scotland, yeah. head of research at Brandywine, he described this to me as you can't really model this on any other previous historical period because it's like an aircraft carrier. They got like tilted yeah. to one side. And now we're going to have this like back and forth, you know, yeah. where you, you could have, and what you're describing is exactly that. We're now all trying to rebuild these inventories at a breakneck pace, expecting that there's going to be this permanent demand. Yeah. And then wait for a recession hits, even if it's shallow, we're going to be massively overstocked. So that's a, that's a really interesting point. And by the way, it's very much like a Chen argument, because I remember in our daily meetings at BCA Research, we'd all be yelling at each other and talking about stuff. And you'd be, <laughs> just, you'd be just calmly reading the Financial Times for like 20 minutes. And I remember you would just say, Stop, 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 stop. Everything you're saying is in the Financial Times. Yep. Tell me something that's not. And I always remember that moment because I always loved that. Like, so yeah. before we get to China, and I promise we have to because Real Vision asked us, but I want to ask yeah. you one more global question. Again, you are a global macro guy. What is not in the Financial Times? I mean, we talked about inflation. We talked about slowdown in China. What are you worried about, like, beyond the curve? What's I think coming what, out there? What we just discussed is not in the uh, Financial Times. Who is talking about potential deflation threat returning? Yeah. I think you may, you may very well end up with a 2024, a very, very chilly uh, world economy with price inflation being very low and with pocket of deflation uh, spreading around. I mean, why, why not? I mean, Japan, look at Japan. Japan now has a little bit of inflation while the, the currency just collapsed. <laughs> if, if the yen stopped collapsing, Japan would be right back to deflation, I guarantee you. And then if you yeah. look at Chinese inflation, it's nothing. Nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And then, you know, the, the dollar is very strong here because that that is reflective of U.S. economic boom, uh, stimulus checks and everything else. I understand, but hey, at the same time, the Fed is doing supersized rate hikes, and then the uh, the fiscal policy is being getting really, really uh, anti growth now. You know, in terms of the impulse, it's very negative. So if you put all those things together. If you don't have a recession, probably you know you're going to have a lower inflation either way. But if you have a recession, I, I'm concerned that you're going to have a wave of deflation. Well, let's let's go to China because obviously yeah. it's an important part of your uh, thesis, and and we share, uh, I think, this bearish outlook. I mean, China's been committed to deleveraging. They've uh, tried to prevent systemic debt crisis. They've constrained domestic investment. Households are basically undergoing balance sheet recession, and then you have zero COVID. And I think my view is zero COVID policy is, is a red herring. It's doing a disservice to most strategists and investors because I'm not sure it would be different if there wasn't zero COVID policy. So I think that, um, you know, China has this secular problem. So, you know, are you basically telling us that there is no new growth driver in China? You know, oh, I don't uh, believe that, Marco. Uh, that, that, that's where probably our view diverges a bit. I think Xi Jinping's policy was to completely making no sense whatsoever. I think it's self-contradictory. It's, you know, think about it. If you have if you have to lock down your economy to achieve zero COVID infection, why? Because you don't have effective vaccines. If you get your population fully vaccinated, why you need to lock it down? You don't need to. 
So these two policies are completely mutually exclusive. I'm telling you one thing. My brother is in China. I ask him, have you got vaccinated? He said, no. I said, why, why the hell not? Yeah, well, so what he is said, that? I don't need to because there's no infection. Where's the infection? I don't see any infection. So you're saying that I have never seen hesitancy. anybody who is, he, he basically his response that I have never seen anybody has infected. I've never seen that. Why do I care about why do I get vaccinated? But you know, Chen, this is an important yeah. point that yeah. I've wondered about. Yeah. You've got a country that's yeah. ostensibly run by an authoritarian government. Yeah. yeah. And it hasn't been able to force people to get vaccinated because no. your point, vaccine is, it's not totally ineffective. It's, no, it's actually, got some effect. Well, actually, you know, actually, Marco, if you look at Chile's number, if you look at Saudi's number, these are all using Chinese vaccine. Yeah. yeah. If, you know, three shots actually basically reduce your death yes. rate, the same thing. Yes. So what I'm saying here is that Xi Jinping is so so silly in terms of implementing this policy. Never now they are paying the price because I'm telling you, my classmates we have a chat group. My classmate is all my age, like 63 to 70 years old. The Chinese policy basically is: if you have underlying disease, you are over 70s, do not get vaccinated. That's weird. I mean, you go and check your Chinese contact. That's the policy because they are not sure whether you're going to have a side effect and things like that. So you are 70 years old. That's why Hong Kong got a lot of people get killed by this spread of disease. Most of, most of the people get killed are seniors because they are not vaccinated. Even today, there are some stores in Beijing re recently requires vaccine passport to, to, to allow people to get in. And then there was huge public back background really that. okay oh, yeah. so that's interesting so china and the u.s kind of share some commonality on vaccine hesitancy that's interesting exactly but but for different reasons yeah for different reasons yeah. for, different, for different reasons because the chinese are saying hey you, you lock it down they're virtually you know in the whole country there are going a couple of hundred a uh, uh, couple of hundreds cases why the hell i need to get vaccinated you know it's like uh, the, the chance of getting vaccine getting infected is bigger than uh, is it smaller than the chance that I get about, you know, I won about a three, I won, win about a three, three million dollars of, of a prize. So nobody's doing that. That's why I'm saying this policy itself, these two policies, I'm telling you, is mutually exclusive. You so is one, the, is you do not have the other. Is zero COVID popular in China? I mean, no. it's obviously not popular no. with you. No, okay. no. So that's why um, I think the people are very fed up with all those lockdowns. But at the same time, people don't want to get vaccinated. That is a very weird combination. If you look, if you read all the paper, if you look, all this demonstration, you know, in Shanghai, people are just, just you know beating their, uh, you know, those Shanghai people yelling and protesting. They, they they don't like lockdown. Nobody likes it. But if if you force them to vaccinate, say, hey, you gotta get, you're gonna show me your vax passport before you get into the restaurants, they'll be pissed off too. The same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing as this banks and you know these people are lining up around the bank this for credit co-op uh, the, the uh, co-ops they yeah, are basically local, payment. yeah so basically local banks and then these banks are outside the, the insurance scheme offered by people's bank China. They, their deposit is not covered by the uh, national insurance uh, policy offered by people's bank of china but they, they offer very high interest rates, so all those local guys put their money into the bank. But hey, they told you at the beginning, we're not covered by this People's Bank of China's insurance scheme. But you know, basically implied assumption is that riskier than if you put a deposit at People's Bank, uh, than the uh, Industrial and Commerce Bank, right? All those big state-owned banks. Now, this COVID policy screw up the economy, the growth collapsed, the property market got a problem and their, their loans are getting trouble. They cannot get back loans. But hey, they are not on the system, they're not on the deposits uh, insurance scheme. So the bank's basically bankrupt. And the depositors are now are demonstra de demonstrating, they are protesting, saying, hey, uh, government has to guarantee my, my deposit. This is like kind of a weird mentality of the Chinese citizen they usually have. I mean, if you buy stock prices, the prices, if, if stock prices collapse, they're going to have a demonstration. They say, hey, 
give me my money back. So you have basically have to have a win-win game. Hey, did you read the? Uh, did you read uh, when you put your do- when you put your deposit in the banks? You kind of like the high rates, but hey, there is a subline here saying that it's not covered by insurance. I don't understand that, but hey, it's a bank. Bank is a bank. You gotta you gotta cover my money. That's why you got all this 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 uh, state-owned bank. I, what I'm trying to tell you is actually these small banks are indicative of the broader problem in the economy because the economy is getting into problem because of the COVID policies. There's no consumption. There's no, there's the property prices is good, is going down, you know, and then loans are turning bad. If it's a uh, if it's a state-owned bank, there's no problem because state-owned banks, their balance sheet is connected with people's, people's Bank of China. There's no problem. You can always print money and then solve them, solve the problem. But hey, these small independent banks, they had a hard constraint. That's why, you know, when they put, when the depositors put their money in, into them, they should honestly, they should know better. So you're saying basically it is about zero COVID policy. And once it's once that a policy large, is removed, yes, yes, like things things normalize after. So when should we expect zero COVID policy to be resolved? Is it in November? You can Congress? see that you can, you can you can see that in the numbers, Marco. You can see there is two big dip in terms of economic growth, all coinciding with national lockdowns. So you can see the first one was like uh, to, late uh, two thousand nineteen to first quarter of 2000, that was when the GDP just dropped. And here we go, the second quarter that was coinciding with the Shanghai when Beijing's lockdown, you can see the GDP dropped. These two cycles are clearly, uh, it's basically a dramatic drop. That can only be caused by war, earthquake, or some, <laughs> or some shock that is not uh, normal, right? So these shock, in my way, in my view, is basically the economic lockdown as a result of this zero COVID policy. So I, I think that that is <clears throat> that is um, that is the reason. Now you start to see all the problems start festering. You know, as it start to fester, you can see property prices, you can see the bank runs, you can see twenty percent of young kids could not find job. You can, yeah. you know, that that's also a big problem. Unemployment rate, yep. Unemployment rate is going to go higher. Um, the, the wage growth is going to go lower. Uh, and then you, the, over time, you will see some social, well, it's already happening. But I, I'm just saying he is dealing with a tough situation. What are you going to so do? So what happens? So what, ha, ha. I think what the, he's, he's trying to hang on until October mm. when he's going to reappoint himself as a, pres- a second to a third term. Um, the, the, one of the big things that, that, that on his political platform is that he has to be able to declare a total victory of, of Chinese policy, Chinese COVID policy, because he has to basically compare the infection rate in China versus the rest of the world, the death rate of China, the uh, COVID, de- COVID deaths versus the rest of the world, basically saying, hey, I've done such a great and fantastic job. Only me who can achieve that. And out of that, I think he's going to change. But the problem here is that you know, there's no there's no independent press. You cannot really say, hey, yes, you have achieved that. What kind of a cost? If you think about all this Omicron uh, disease, they got about a couple of thousand, you know, 2,000 cases or something. Hey, if you calculate per, per capita cost of per infection, that's, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's, like, that's the most expensive in the whole world. So I think the probably October, after October, um, I think they, they have to basically let it rip. I don't think there's any, any, any other options. So I have two questions then. Yeah. One, you're basically saying October comes along, November, we have the party Congress. I won the end, proclaim victory. Uh, oh, by the way, get vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. And then how do you revive credit growth at that point? Is, is credit growth going to be revived simply because demand returns, because COVID is over, or will they need to do more to support credit well, growth they, through they, infrastructure they, spending? And Yeah, I think that's a very, very valid question, but I, I think the question we have as an economy, I keep asking myself, you know, what would be the uh, natural state 
natural rate of growth for any economy. I don't care whether it's China, United States, or, or anywhere else. Um, the natural rate of growth for any economy basically consists of two parts. You know that. It's, one is your urban population growth. The other one is the labor productivity growth. What would be the labor productivity growth? These two things basically combine, give you uh, your natural rate of growth. I have no doubt that Chinese economies are not going to go back to uh, six, seven, or eight percent growth. That's that's way too high, simply because if you look at the urban population growth right now, it's probably the highest point was five and six percent in the 80s. Now it's about 1.5. Yeah. And over time, probably going to be zero. Mm. Okay. So anyway, one and a half percent, then you give me a number of labor productivity growth. It used to be 10, 15 in, in the 90s and 2000, early part of 2000. Right now, it's probably about a three, four percent at this per capita GDP level. Yeah. So let's say three, four percent plus one and a half. That's that's I think that's where their five and a half percent number comes from. Come, right. come from. OK, um, but then sometimes you can be above that. Sometimes you can. Below that, I think that's that's where uh, that's where we are here. We're below right now, but I think at some point you're going to bounce back. But hey, in terms of credit growth, the natural rate of growth is independent of whether you have a credit expansion or not. Basically, you can self finance. It has nothing to do with that. Of course, if you have a credit expansion, probably going to you can get there easier. Probably without it, it's probably getting there. A little bit harder. You have a whole bunch of other adjustments that you need to make. But the bottom line here is, I always say that. I said that before. I continue to hold the view. You probably know my spiel. That is a very high savings economy today. If you look at gross national savings rate in China, it's still forty percent. How the hell are you going to allocate that forty percent savings to investment? How do how do you do that? If you don't, if you do, if we all know that savings has you to be invest. You have to invest. You have to invest. How to how to how to make that investment happen? You basically have two channels or three channels. Private, you basically have to borrow. Somebody has to borrow the money. In the private market, all the government has to borrow from the public bond market to spend it, or you have to export that to abroad, running current account surplus. And that's the only three ways to deal with that. I think that's why naturally you have a very high savings rate. You're you indebtedness. You Domestic indebtedness has to be high. This is exactly why Japan has very high public sector debt GDP ratio, about 300%. That's why Singapore has a very high private credit to GDP ratio because their savings rate is high, and then they have to they have to uh, uh, intermediate that to the investment. Now, the only feasible way to do that is through the banking system. The U.S. is unique in the sense that the U.S. basically allocates seventy percent of, of savings through the capital market, the stock market. Stock market. Yeah. Nobody can do that. Nobody. Yeah. In this Most world, not, banking, not yeah. Europe. No, not Europe. Not China. For sure, it's not 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 China. So that's the thing. We're saying this high indebtedness that's going to continue to be there. I don't know whether it's going to be a problem. It could be a problem because if you have a high debt. It's not like the stock market. Stock market, if you have a misallocation of resources, stock market is going to drop. Loss will be socialized. Too bad. You made a bad bet. You're done. Whereas if you do through, if you do the allocation, if you centralize the banking system, then the, the risk is not socialized. It's concentrated. That's why you, you might have this periodic bank runs like this small four small banks that is happening. So all I'm saying here is. Um, I'm not unduly pessimistic about growth, but I'm very, very frustrated by Xi Jinping's economic policy because he has no focus. That's the problem. Okay, His well, let's economic talk about policy that. has no po focus whatsoever. Well, let's talk about that because yeah. obviously your point is that the high savings rate has to be intermediated. Yeah. And that goes back to my original question. You know, what yeah. is the next growth driver of Chinese economy? The reason I... Like, yeah. To put your hat on. Yeah. I guess I would say, let me rephrase that question. Because your point yeah. is look, the Chinese growth driver is productivity and yeah. labor force growth, Mark. We're yeah. going to get to five and a half, five yeah. percent. Okay. But then what sectors of the economy should we be bullish on? Where is this savings going to be intermediated into so that we can get ahead of it? Yeah. You know, and, and make money. Yeah, yeah. That's that's excellent question, Marco. Um, 
I do believe one thing here. Um, when I experienced the Chinese economic reform in the early 80s, what did Deng Xiaoping do? He didn't do anything but saying, hey, let the market take over. Just let it go. The market will figure it out. He did not know. You know, right now they, they are sort of bullshitting saying, you know, have a, they have a macro design. No, there's no macro design. He was saying, hey, I got to cross the river by feeding the stones. I, he basically said, I did not know. All I know is let it go. When you let the economy go, the economy, the business people and the entrepreneurs, they will figure out a way to get the economy going. So I would say in the end, we, we realized in hindsight, everything is uh, 2020. For the last 20, 30 years, the big driving force is construction. Of course, yeah, it's like right. farm-based economy becoming industrialized powerhouse. You basically have to build your cities. You know, that happened to be a major driving force. Real estate, capital construction, that is basically has been the driving force. I can guarantee you that's not going to be the same story going forward. Where the hell the driving force here will be? I have not, I have, I don't know. Uh, Xi Jinping does not know. All he needs to know is that you have to design a policy that, that, that is conducive for private people, private business people to do their own things. You cannot have a policy that is a restrict people's business opportunities. You, you cannot have a policy that is actually demotivate people from doing some, you know, risky stuff. That's where I have a problem with him. Okay, so in terms of in terms of where in terms of where the growth, I can give you a few examples. I think they have a very strong ambition to be the absolute leader in in electrical vehicle. They, you know, right now the physical stimulus. Everybody understand that they have to physically stimulate the economy because otherwise your your growth is going to get into a problem because of the zero COVID policy. But hey, that's a good story to tell, but it's difficult to make money. Why? The physical st stimulus right now is no longer, they said that very clear, it's no longer the same as the fiscal stimulus in the past. In the past, it's a capital construction, build highways, and, you know, railroads and stuff like that. But this time around, 20, 25% of the physical stimulus is going to be in the same thing. But the majority of the money will be spent on building digital infrastructure. What exactly does that mean? I have no idea. I don't know what that is. Maybe G6, G, 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 G5, 5G, 6G, I have no idea. But bottom line here is that you can see they basically, the economy, I think a natural force to gravitate away from construction because you build up the city. You can try to go to Chinese cities. They are beautifully built. You can't build that again. That's stupid. That's dumb. But what will be the next driver? I think the government has a plan, which is electrical vehicles and you know 5G network and things like that. But hey, is the market force, market, are market forces agree with them? I have no idea, I don't know. We don't know. I think these things are naturally unknown in advance because if you let the market find it their own way, they will find their own uh, field. That's gonna drive the next growth. That is a very, uh, very laissez faire. Yeah, uh, it's 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 a it's a great like defensive laissez faire from Chen. Um, I hear you. Uh, <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, let me ask you uh, sort of in a conclusion here. Um, you know, other than the productivity rate, which is obviously higher than in the West, what kind of keeps you optimistic over the very long term about China? You know, so not the next five years, not the next 12 months, but like, let's say the next decade, you know, because, you know, to what extent do you think China is going to be able to challenge the U.S. and the West, which is the view, of, the consensus view, I think, in the West yeah. is that China's becoming a peer competitor. So over the very long term view, like what, what gives you confidence or optimism? I had a, I had a s same uh, discussion with, with, actually with my brother, who was, by the way, uh, very senior government official and retired now. We had a lot of very intense debate there. Um, I think my I'm opti I'm I'm more optimistic about shorter term, like three four years period, because I I can't see that the zero COVID policy be pursued 
um, mindlessly, like like they have that, that, like what they have done now. They they have to change. They have to go some kind of hybrid and eventually abandon this lockdown stuff. That's nonsense. You can't do that. So once that happens, I think consumption business activity is going to have a spurt of recovery. There's no question in my mind. Longer term, I start have a doubt because um, a I don't know when President Xi Jinping is going to. Uh, going to be in power. I have no idea. Is it five years, 10 years? I have no idea. Now, he was born 53, so I'm very sure if he turns 70, and then if he do if he does another 10 years, it'll be 80. Okay, that's a that's getting uh, interesting situation. But importantly, I'm not very confident in his economic policy. The reason I'm saying that is that if you think about the Chinese economic policy over the last 30, 40 years, it's the focus has always been very sharp. If you think Deng Xiaoping, his policy is very simple. Black cat, white cat, I don't give a damn which cat. That's only catch mouth, you're a good cat. They yeah. basically say, hey, market take over. Government get out. Worked. And then, and then Jiang Zemin, um, that's the 90s, his policy was also very straightforward. He called that a three representative, but I think it's it's nonsense. Basically saying, I want to turn Chinese Communist Party into a production party. Anything good for productivity go, uh, growth, go for it. It's a continuation of Deng Xiaoping's black cat and white cat theory. So it's very clear. It's a focus on efficiency, equalities comes to the second. That's why the growth it's very fast, and then that's actually created a miracle. When 1990s, you had a low inflation, a falling inflation, but 10% growth. That was a beautiful time. And then his predecessor, Hu Jintao, even though he's incompetent president in my view, but his policy nonetheless is very clear. He turned to the left. You, know, you, you want to have, you know, you want to have, Economic harmony. You want to be taking care of your poor people. So he Share turned the policy the the, uh, to the left. Yeah. Okay. Understand. You know, everybody understands their policy angle. So they're saying, you know, I understand because over the last thirty years we moved far towards the right. Now we correct to the left a bit. That's okay. Now Xi Jinping. What the hell is his policy? His typical policy statement is, I not only want this, but also that and, and, and that too. So basically, he wants everything. He wants green, he wants efficiency, he wants common prosperity, but he also wants efficiency. Hey, you give me a platter of things that are logically inconsistent and incoherent. How the hell you want your local governments to execute these policy platters. That's the fundamental problem of this guy. That's that's what I'm saying. I don't like his policy at minute because I don't see the focus. You basically want too many things. I mean, we know trade-off. The economics is all about trade-off. Any policy choice, you have a cost. You can't have everything without any cost. Everybody be happy. The entrepreneurs are happy. The poor workers are happy. You know, the farmers are happy. And, and then, you know, anybody in the cities are happy. You cannot have that. Sorry. So I think that's that's my concern, long term concern, because the policy is very important. Because we all, I went through uh, 80s China's change reform. It's all about policy. If you have a policy that let people do their own thing, the economy always flourish. If you try to constrain, if you try to design some policy from the top, it's always a disaster. So that's when, that's when. I am a little bit concerned about his economic policy. You know, Chen, uh, yeah. you know, you started off by saying you have a bullish bias and it was, it's interesting because you have a little bit of a bearish bias then for the long term. And that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I think that's, that those, those of us who know you and who have read your, by the way, uh, by the way, research. I've been living, I've been living in the West more than I've been living in China. Now the time that I spent in the West now exceeded the time I spent in China. So that's why I probably become more and more balanced. <laughs> no, no, I always say this. I say this to my wife all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Serbian, but I had the Canadian operating system downloaded into my brain. So yeah. I, I hear you. 
Well, yeah. Chen, this is, uh, this is great. Uh, anyone who wants to read your research can go to Alpine Macro's website, right? You want yes, to plug yes. some, where should, we, where should we go to get your research? Well, www.alpinemacro.com, that's it. Awesome. Simple. <laughs> it's very simple. Chen, thank right. you so much. It's such a pleasure and honor to interview you, and I hope people got uh, what they came so to much, see. Marco. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, Marco, gonna talk in our conference, gonna speak at our conference. The, uh, the yes, New event. York, New York yeah. conference, Alpine New York conference October is October seventeenth. October seventeenth. I was looking at my calendar. Yeah. That's right. Marco, All right. you're well, such a uh, uh, charismatic speaker. Is that that uh, very few people can can do that? I mean, be well, be be very very. I learned it from Chen. Come on. I, I learned to do this from I learned how to be hyperbolic and to make calls. That's what we need to do. Make no, calls. No, no, don't no, not no. make calls. Too kind. Thank Too you so much, Chen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, Thank Bye you. For Thanks, man. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.